Okay, so hi, let me begin with the quick story. Imagine that you are in the situation in the, that you are waiting in a shop queue and the first person in that queue suddenly realized that uh, he forgot their wallet and he needs to go to the parking to grab this wallet and to back to the shop to pay uh, for, the, for his goodies. And even if the shop assistant could serve the next, ne uh, next person, she realized that she has open transaction. And because that open transaction, she's not able to proceed with the next person to save the time. And imagine that this issue with the open transaction is also occur in uh, Python, in the SQL uh, alchemy. So for now, no, no matter what this function does, uh, what if I will tell you, if you will use SQL alchemy to uh, get the resources from the uh, databases, this function can handle around 30 requests per uh, second. But if we will uh, change the SQL alchemy to uh, databases, now the same code, 99% of, uh, of the previous code, now can handle around, okay, every time this, okay, I need to switch, okay, sorry for that. So now the databases, the same code, but with the databases can handle 170 requests per second such nice improvements, right? And this is the best part. With some knowledge of the SQL alchemy and little uh, and bit improvement, the first, uh, the code from the, from the first example also can handle 170 requests per uh, second. So sounds interesting. So let's deep dive into asynchronous uh, SQL alchemy. We'll mostly talk about transactions and connections. My name is Dan Wysocki and let me quickly introduce myself. So I have been working with Python for six years uh, now. Uh, currently I'm working at uh, Mirumi Software in Poland, uh, but that's not uh, all. I'm also a mentor at Mirumi Starter. This is our initiative when we teach Python from scratch. And on the top of that, I also, I'm also an organizer of a local IT meetup called MeetTech. It's really nice uh, in context of my small hometown that we have placed to gather the uh, people to share the knowledge and uh, uh, go through the uh, uh, latest trends in the uh, industry. So let's jump into the code. Uh, let's start with the example. We call this implicit transaction example and we'll go line by line to see what is happening here. So first we will create uh, an async engine to connect to uh, the database. Uh, then we need a session uh, factory and it's followed by a simple function to just return this session. Uh, this will be used as a dependency injection. It's important to note that we are using SQL Alchemy in context of Fast API, so we need to initialize the Fast API uh, app. And for the sake of the clarity, we will omit this code for, uh, from subsequent uh, slides since it remains the same. So finally, we have an ASIC function that handles HTTP GET uh, method. This function retrieve and return the node from the database based on provide, uh, provided uh, ID. So let's get deeper into the uh, details. On the left side, we have uh, our code. On the right hand side, we have logs that our application will uh, generate. So these logs are essential for us to understand what is happening uh, in context of SQL Alchemy and how SQL Alchemy manage the session uh, through the uh, dependency injection. So now we, we execute the, the scout and go line by line to see what uh, the logs uh, this application will produce. So now we are on the third line and no logs appear. So that means that uh, 
um, starting the session, creating the session, which is thus by dependency injection because our function already has access to the database, right? Uh, doesn't, it's not the same as uh, acquiring the connection. So far, no connection is acquired, which is good, right? Moving forward. Uh, yeah, moving forward. We are now on the five line, and we can observe that some logs appear. So uh, first, the connection is really acquired. Uh, after that, transactions, uh, transaction begins implicitly, and after that, we can see our select uh, statement. After the exiting the function, we notice that next set of logs appear. From these logs, uh, we can see that we return the response first. Following that, SQL Alchemy perform a rollback, and then connection is released. So let's stop for a moment and pay, pay attention for the few important uh, things here. So firstly, SQL Alchemy automatically start the transaction which means that the connections and transactions are closely linked. Uh, secondly, we may observe that even for a simple select statement, uh, SQL Alchemy proceeds with the rollback. So it could be surprising, right? Because even for a, uh, for a select, we can notice the rollback uh, is here. It could be tricky. Uh, and. Uh, this rollback is uh, because we need to close the uh, transaction. By closing the transaction, the uh, connection returns back to the uh, connection pools, pool. And lastly, we notice that we return response first, and then we release the uh, connection, which not might be so efficient, so let's delve deeper into this uh, aspect. So, here we have simplified uh, request lifecycle in uh, fast IP, uh, fast IPI. API. Uh, we will focus on the interesting steps for us because it's not this presentation. This presentation is not about fast IPI uh, itself. So let's move. So here is the first one where when the request uh, comes. Moving forward, uh, we have our dependency injection, where, which start the uh, transaction. Uh, moving forward, we have request execution when the transaction is uh, begin and the connection is actually acquired. And this is the place, uh, this is the step where the request is actually uh, executed, right? So moving forward, a few steps more. Uh, on the ninth step, we return the uh, response. And on the last, uh, 10 step, the uh, connection is, uh, the transaction is closed, connection is released, and the session is uh, closed. Uh, an important observation here is that we are really wasting our resources, which, which in this context is connection to the database, right? Because uh, we need this connection only on the fourth step, uh, because this is the place when we execute the uh, request. And one thing, on the 10th step, we have middleware provided by FastAPI, which closes, uh, which ensures that, uh, uh, that the uh, dependency injection, that the object uh, injected by dependency injection is closed. That's why uh, on the 10th step, is, uh, session is closed, right? Okay, so, uh, now we know uh, that we are wasting resources. Uh, let's see how we can solve this uh, issue. So this is the old code. Let's some, make some mo uh, modifications. As you can see, one uh, noticeable change is that we've wrapped our code with the database begin statement, which means that we start uh, session, uh, SQL Alchemy session uh, in explicit way. And once again, we will execute this function and go line by, li line, by line and see what logs it produce. So now we are on the uh, fourth line, and again, no logs uh, are produced at this moment. That means that entering uh, into the context manager uh, and 
uh, explicitly starting the session is, is not the same as acquiring the connection. So moving forward, uh, yeah, the same as previously. On the database execute, the first logs appear, and uh, so far nothing uh, changed. The transaction is uh, started, uh, the connection is uh, acquired, the transaction is started implicitly, and uh, uh, followed by our select statement. And now, upon the exit context manager, the next set of logs becomes visible. We notice a commit happening, followed by release the uh, connection. Here we can see uh, the change compared to the previous example. Instead of rollback, we have a commit statement. And moving forward, now when we exit the function, uh, the logs uh, show us that we return the uh, response. So in this example, we release the connection first and then return the uh, response. This approach uh, is look like improvement, right? Okay, so let's compare the logs from these two uh, examples. As I mentioned earlier, we have significant uh, improvement here. Once we can see on the right hand side, we release the connection uh, first, followed by returning the uh, response. Furthermore, is, uh, it is worth noting that in both examples, we can still observe occurrence or rollback or commit. This behavior is inherent to SQL alchemy management of transactions and connections. And to gain deeper understanding uh, how uh, our solution works, uh, let's see how it fits in our uh, simplified request lifecycle. So this is our initial solution, the uh, 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 first example, right, that we know that we uh, acquiring the connection on the fourth step and release it on the last 10 step. And now uh, this is how it looks uh, with the possible solution. We can clearly, no, we now we now don't. But I will fix it in the moment. Yeah, and now we see uh, that uh, we uh, re uh, acquired and released the connection on the fourth step, and this is what we want because on, only on the fourth step we really need the uh, connection, right? So. Uh, where is my mouse? Yeah, here it is. So, to summarize what we have learned so far, uh, we understand the close relationship between transactions and uh, connection. SQL, SQL alchemy handles entire operations uh, behind the scenes, uh, and it's important to be aware of what is happening because there are a lot of things happen implicitly. Uh, we have also discovered that even for a uh, s simple select statement, uh, that transaction is started implicitly. And furthermore, to release the connection, we need to close the uh, transaction, which, which explain why we may occur the uh, rollback or commit, even if we don't uh, execute it explicitly. So, Let's dive into more uh, practical example using the knowledge that we uh, gained earlier. Uh, we'll break down this example into smaller uh, pieces. So uh, in this example, we set pool size uh, to five, which means that our application uh, have five available connection to the database. And uh, this scenario involves handling HTTP uh, post request, and this is how uh, this is what uh, is going here. So first we validate uh, node ID, and then we need to get to uh, our database uh, for this uh, for external ID based on this node ID. This this, this external ID is needed to uh, make call to external API, and. Now to make some node synchronization with our database, uh, that's why we need to call to this uh, external API. And it's important to note that this call take approximately five seconds. 
and uh, this five second is only for the uh, testing purpose. Okay, and once, once we receive the response from the external API, we update our node uh, with provided uh, uh, data by uh, external service. Finally, we return the response. So, at first glance, this function may look just okay. All I.O. blocking uh, functions are awaited. So, nothing, you can, you can say that nothing wrong uh, will happen here, right? So, normal async function. So, let's test it. Uh, now let's analyze the benchmark to assess the uh, situation. First, we will run the benchmark to me measure the response time of, uh, of this request. And as you can see, with the five concurrent re requests and the pool size, uh, to remind you, the pool size is equal to, uh, to five. Uh, and uh, for the five concurrent requests, it took approximately five seconds which is okay because the call to the external API takes five seconds, so uh, this aligns with our expectations, right? So now let's make the same benchmark, but for the 10 concurrent request, and something happened here, right? Because the first group of the, uh, the first five requests take five seconds each, and the subsequent uh, request, the next group, uh, take uh, 10 seconds. So this doubling response time means something, and we need to, we need to discover what uh, happening here and uh, what is the, uh, our bottleneck. So let's analyze the uh, situation by breaking it down visually. In this animation, we'll, uh, on the left side, uh, we have our uh, request with the uh, two colors that align to the uh, benchmark from the previous uh, slide. Uh, yeah, these requests are divided into two groups, uh, blue and pink. Uh, in the middle we have our uh, connection pool with, with the five available uh, connections. And on the right hand side we have uh, either pink or blue arrow pointing to a specific line of code as the request is being uh, handled. This color of a given arrow is associated with a corresponding re uh, request on the uh, left. At the bottom, we have a timeline. So let's start. And we will start on the uh, nine line of the code where uh, the database execute operation occurs. At this point, we notice that blue group of requests occupies all available uh, connections. The connections are indicated as green, indicating that uh, these requests are performing database uh, operations. After that, the uh, blue group make five concurrent uh, API calls to external uh, service. Once the uh, five seconds have passed, the blue group received the response from the exter external API and proceed with the uh, database update operation. It's important to note that during this time, the, pool per the pink group is still waiting on the nine line as the connections are unavailable. Once again, the blue group received the response from the external API and the connections to green to perform database update operation. On, after the uh, commit, the connections are released back to the connection pool, and the blue group is ready to re uh, return the response. And uh, now uh, the uh, pink group uh, acquired this uh, connection to retrieve the external ID uh, needed for making a call to external API the connections turn green during this database operation. And now uh, pink group uh, will wait five seconds for the response from the uh, external API. After the five second interval, when the response from the external API is received, we can see that pink group proceed with the data, uh, database operation. After the commit, the connections are uh, released back to the connection pool, 
and the ping group is ready to return the response. So from this analysis, uh, we can under, uh, identify the bottleneck. We keep connection even if we don't need them. Uh, in this example, we make call to external API that take around five seconds. During this time, the blue group occupies all available connections. This prevents pink group uh, from getting these uh, connections for themselves. Initially, it might not be obvious that the number of available uh, connections could be a, a bottleneck. Now we know that uh, the bottleneck is causing our connections to be kept for too long, since we are unnecessarily wait for the external API call to uh, finish. This, this has great impact <coughs> of our uh, web API, uh, as we do not release the uh, connection as soon as we could. Uh, simply increasing the number of the connection would be a temporary, uh, temporary solution and wouldn't address the root cause. To tackle this problem, we need to modify uh, our code that will better manage the uh, connections. As you can see, we have wrapped uh, every database execute with uh, database begin. This will ensure that the connection is released after the execute is called. Now let's revisit uh, our, visualiz uh, our visualization and observe the change that we have uh, made. So yeah, this is the visualiz visualization from the previous slide, but with the, uh, our uh, modifications. And we'll go again line by line and see what happens here. So once again, we pause on the uh, database uh, execute and the blue groups grab all available connection and proceed with the database operation. And now blue group exit the context manager. Uh, the connections are uh, released. The pink group take advantage of this and acquires the connection to perform their select operation. Meanwhile, the blue group make uh, an external uh, API call. And uh, now the both uh, groups uh, are uh, making a call to the external API. And it's important to note that not much time elapsed Right, and uh, both uh, groups uh, now just waiting for the response from the uh, external API. After the five second mark, we can see that um, both groups, uh, yeah, uh, we can observe that uh, both groups uh, stopped on, on the database uh, execute and the blue groups grab the uh, connections to uh, perform the, their database operations. Uh, following the commit at ag and exit the context manager, the blue group is ready to return the response. Uh, now the pink group can proceed with their database operation size. The connections are available once again. And now uh, after the uh, commit, the connections are released and Ping group is ready to return the response in just five seconds. So by implementing these changes, we have greatly improved the performance and eliminated the uh, bottleneck caused by exhausted uh, connections. Let's see how it uh, match in our uh, benchmarks that we uh, see previously. This is the old benchmark. Right, and ta -da. Yeah, now the both groups need five seconds even for the 10 concurrent uh, requests with the five uh, available connection with uh, the pool size is equal to, uh, to five. Now the both groups need uh, five sec around five seconds to complete their uh, task. So what do programmers love the most? The diagrams, that's right. 
So here we have two uh, diagrams uh, that are more detailed visualization, visual, visual representation of where resources are being wasted. Unfortunately, due to time constraint, we won't be able to delve them into further. Uh, however, who, uh, for those who are interested in uh, diagrams, here is the uh, QR code. You can scan and see those uh, diagrams. Okay. Uh, I have bonus for you, uh, which is the uh, other library that uh, handles connection to the uh, database, which is encode, uh, encode databases. Library that, uh, called databases by the encode. Uh, let's see uh, how it fits in, uh, in our code. So this is the code from the previous example that we already know. Uh, it has issue with the connection management. management, management. Uh, let's modify it using uh, databases. As you can notice, just only one thing changed here. Uh, only the part how we initialize the connection engine to uh, database. Uh, because uh, databases understand SQL alchemy dialect. Uh, so the body of our function and how we uh, construct the query is the same. We are using SQL alchemy, but uh, the main change is how we connect to, to the database using databases. Uh, to give you more context, this is how whole code looks like uh, with the connections. And let's see uh, we're, uh, more practical benchmarks now. Uh, we will run the benchmarks uh, with 1,000 concurrent uh, users. Uh, our application will have 10 available connections. Uh, we will set pool size to and we will run our application on one worker. So this is the first example, which can handle only 30 requests per uh, second. And this is the code with the, our modification that uh, where we improve the uh, connection management, and now it can handle uh, 170 requests per second. And what about databases? You already know from the first slide, it also can handle 170 requests per uh, second. And the code look like, looks like, the, the, yeah, uh, from the previous example, right? Without this, con uh, without opening this context manager, uh, because the databases doesn't, uh, uh, do not open implicitly uh, transaction, which contributes to the higher performance as we uh, observe. So for the summary, uh, for those who are familiar with Zen of Python, you should know that explicit is better than implicit. Uh, explicit management of the connection give us a uh, uh, great improvement. And we should know uh, that we should release the connection as soon as is, as is possible. We don't need the connection, we should uh, promptly release it because the connection is passed by a reference. So this means that we do not uh, terminate and create new connection to the database, uh, but the connections are there, we're just passing the uh, reference. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Damian. Uh, great talk. We have uh, time for one, maybe two questions. Uh, please use the microphone there. Or... Yeah, hi. Thanks for, thanks for the talk. 
Um, how does it work then with rollbacks? If I have two different connections, I close one of them along the way, can I still roll back everything I did in one API call? Uh, no. The, we, uh, by default, we don't want to have our uh, uh, database statement to be atomic, right? We don't need to wrap in transactions. So answering to your question, no, you, you are not able to do this because when you close a transaction, that means that you did already everything that is related with this, uh, uh, with this operation, right? Uh, if you need to do something atomically, you need to wrap everything with one uh, transaction, right? To do not lose uh, uh, the data, right? Thank you. Uh, if you have uh, more questions, you can uh, find uh, Damian outside uh, or in Discord. Thank you again, Damian. Great talk. Thanks.